praise team being late for worship, is there? But that's okay. We'll get started right now. Why don't you stand and sing with us? There is a shaking that hearts awaken. Our God is moving, forever changing. that you're in the house of the Lord today. How many of you are thankful that the presence of God is here with us today? Amen, amen. We are so glad that you are here to join us. Even those of you who are worshiping with us online, we're thankful that you have joined us as well. You know, this is one of my favorite songs and it's been one of my favorite for many years. Breathe on us. You know, it's simply just an invitation for the Lord's presence to breathe on us, to fill us, to have that in, in feeling of His presence and His Holy Spirit. And it's a powerful thing when we really invite God to move and have His way in our lives and to fill our hearts and our churches with more of His presence. How many would say we need more of God's presence in our lives? Whether we're in the church, whether we're in our school systems, whether we're on our jobs or even in our car. I love to 
worship when I'm in my car. So if y'all pull up beside me at the red light and I'm crying or I'm just going to town singing, you know I'm in the presence of the Lord, right? Don't judge me. Don't look at me funny. Just, just be like, praise the Lord, Brandy, praise the Lord. But David prayed prayers of invitation all the time. And we read in Psalms chapter 86, verses 16 through 17, he said, Turn to me and have mercy on me. Give me a sign of your goodness. For you, O oh Lord, have helped me and you have comforted me. I don't know how many of you this morning need help from the Lord. How many of you may, how many of you just need to be comforted by the Holy Spirit this morning? But I am so thankful that I serve a God and I know that I have felt those things in my own life and I know that you have and you can too, whatever situation you're facing. And our worship and our praise always brings his presence because he enthrones himself on our praise. Psalms 22, three says, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. This is the moment that we invite God to renew our lives and fill us with his spirit. And by surrendering our full self to God, God reveals more of himself to us, but we first have to be open to what God is wanting to do. We first have to be receiving that presence in his spirit in our hearts and in our lives. And so this morning, I know we've got our we've got our prayer our prayer request up here and there's many we all have there's several that I think are not up there right now but I know many of us have things have needs in our lives and we're saying God I need comfort and I need your presence Heavenly Father I thank you for this wonderful day even though it's raining God, I just pray and ask that your presence and your spirit, Lord, would rain down upon us in this house, Lord. God, I pray that you would move in such a mighty and incredible way in our lives, in our hearts today. As we're sitting here, Lord, or as we're sitting at home, being a part of this worship service. God, I pray that we would just be open to receiving your word and your anointing in this house. Lord, you know each and every need, Lord, that is being listed up here. And God, even those that are unspoken in our hearts and our lives. God, I'm praying that you would move in those situations. Lord, we're praying for healing in those bodies. Lord, strengthen those that are taking care of them. Lord, we pray for, Lord, just knowledge, Lord, for these doctors and these nurses as they're taking care of these patients. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and for your grace. Lord, every day of our lives. Lord, we just worship you in this place today. Amen. Good morning and welcome to the Vidalia Church of God. We are happy you have chosen to worship with us today. Let's stop just a minute and bring you up to date on the happenings of the week. As we enter into the Easter season, join us Palm Sunday, March 28th at 6 p.m. This will be a very special night of worship. April 2nd, mark your calendars, parents. We Church and Kids Central is glowing. Friday night, April the 2nd, Egg Hunt and much, much more, 6 to 8 p.m. We want all kids here for this event. Sunday, April 4th, is Easter Sunday. A continental breakfast will be served from 9.30 to 10.15 a.m. for you and your family in the Smith Center. Also available will be a unique Easter photo area to take pictures. There will be no live groups. Come early and enjoy a time of fellowship before worship at 10.30. Pastor Appreciation is Sunday, April the 18th. We want to take this time to show Pastor and Sister Kim how much we love and appreciate all they do for our VCOG family. Morning service begins at 10.30 a.m. Life groups will meet as usual at 9.30. Pastor Appreciation, Sunday, April the 18th. You can stay up to date with all of our church events by following our social media platforms. That's all the news this week. Should you need us, do not hesitate to give Pastor Merritt or the staff a call. Have a great week, and we'll see you the next service. Thank you. 
this last song that we're going to sing today, the chorus just very simply says, Oh Christ, be magnified. In your way today, will you magnify the Sovereign Father, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the downtrodden, the healer of the sick, the Redeemer of all mankind. Worship with us as we sing. Suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one breath. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. magnify the Lord. Let's magnify Him. Would you just magnify Him by saying, Lord, I want my life and I want my praise and I want all that I am to magnify You. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in Your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. Father, we come into this place to recognize You, to honor You, to magnify You. You're worthy to be lifted up. We lift you today. Come on, church, lift him with me. In your own way, in your own words, just worship him in spirit and truth. Father, we bless you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful chorus. What a beautiful prayer. What a beautiful life. Lord, we live to magnify you. Hallelujah. May it be the heartbeat of our hearts and lives and souls and families and church to lift you, to magnify you to, so that you're seen that we may decrease, that you may increase in everything that we're about. We bless you. We praise you. Don't you love him? Don't you thank God for his presence today? He is so good to us. He is so good to us.
children, I draw you to myself that you may know my nature, my character, my presence. That I am the God who is for you. That I am the God who makes a way in your life, through your circumstances. That you may see that I am the Lord who goes before you and fights your battles. Trust in me, says the Lord. Release to me your worries and struggles and see the glory of my salvation this day, says the Lord. Would you just give the Lord your very mind and life and heart? Lord, we bless you. We praise you. Hallelujah. 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 Church, thank God for his presence in your life this morning. Thank him for his word in your life. Thank you, Lord, for being close to us today. Thank you for speaking to us personally in our hearts as we worship you. Thank you for the prophetic gift that you speak to your church and your body. We don't take these gifts and manifestations for granted today. We thank you. We bless you. We praise you. Hallelujah. I feel more like praising than preaching, but would you just praise him again with me? We just allow him to touch you right where you are as you praise him. Fill us, Lord. Fill us. Fill up in us what's lacking in our minds and in our hearts. Rekindle the fire of the Holy Spirit that we burn for you and we long for you and we desire you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Would you turn around and greet somebody with a, an air wave or high five or something and let them know that you love them? Let, you know, let them know that you care about them. Boy, it's good to see you in the house of worship today. Yesterday was the first day of spring. Is that right? Well, we got to tell Mr. Sun and temperature and all of that. But uh, anyway. God is good, and we had a wonderful day yesterday. We restarted pray and go, and uh, we uh, we think estimated we probably prayed for about 100 homes in our surrounding area. Can you say praise the Lord for that? Amen. And we left them this door hanger. It's very non-confrontational, but I tell you, it's powerful, and. Uh, just says, we prayed for you, Vidalia Church of God. And on the back, it says, Vidalia Church of God, we love our community, so we are praying for our community. And, uh, and we give them an opportunity. We have a special email address just for this. And the people we prayed for, if they've got a special request, they can email us. And, uh, and then, of course, we give them the time of our service and the address of our church. But God is really blessing. Now, Easter is two weeks, and we purposely... Uh, started our pray and go back uh, two weeks before Easter so that we can touch our community. How many of you believe that people are looking for hope more than, than maybe in our lifetime? And I really do. I just really do. People are struggling, and we hear a lot about depression and some different things going on. But we have the answer in Jesus Christ, and this is what I'm asking you to do. Now, next week I'm going to have some little cards printed, little invitation cards. You don't have to use those. But if you've got family members, if you've got family members that are unchurched, they're not in church, invite them. Did you know that according to every study I've ever seen, that most people come to church because a friend or a family member invited them? 80% plus. Did you know that less than 10% will come because they saw an advertisement? Usually that's people that move into your town and they're looking for a new church uh, or they go to your website and, and they're, they're searching those things out. And that's good. That's okay. Let Get this. You want to know how effective I am? Less than 10%, about 6% comes because the pastor of the church invited them. But guess what? When you invite your family and your friends 
That's the greatest way for us to see conversion grow. And that's the way, greatest way for us to see our church grow. And, and so I'm going to invite you, let's make this Easter Sunday a rallying point that we're going to get back in the habit of inviting people. Uh, you know, just invite, if you've got family that's out of church, invite them over for Sunday dinner. And say, well, now, Sunday lunch. And say, the caveat is, you've got to come to church with me. Hey, we're going to have the photo booth, and I'm taking a little time here. We're going to have the photo booth that Miss Vicki uh, has done such a great job with. It's going to be special for our church that day, and uh, for you to take a great family photo. We're just going to take some time uh, in between Sunday school, uh, 9.30, not in between Sunday school, but from 9.30 to about 10.15 to, to have a continental breakfast. It'll be prepackaged. Uh, we're going to have a photo booth, booth to get a photo of your family on Easter, and uh, we're just believing it's going to be a time for us to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ more than anything, and uh, we can share that love with each other. So uh, make sure you invite somebody to be with us this coming Easter Sunday. You know, it's time to give, and uh, the Bible tells me in Malachi 3.10, you all know it, here it comes, bring all, everybody say all all the tithe into the storehouse I ain't going there but all means all hey you know Jesus said to the Pharisees said woe to you because you bring tithe of every little minute thing He said, you ought to have done this, but you've left the weightier matters undone, mercy and justice. And that tells me if I tithe with a wrong heart, God can't bless me. But he didn't say don't tithe on all. He just said tithe, putting first things first. And the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1, 2, 3, they first of all gave themselves to the Lord. And then they gave of their material blessing. It's just a little sermon before the sermon as you see the offering app uh, guide on the screen. Uh, be sure, thank you for all that you do. It's just a wonderful blessing to partner with you. Thank you for being part of the kingdom work here. And the offering plate is in the foyer as you leave today. If you haven't already placed your tithe there or either go online and do that. Hey, so today... I am concluding this message series. You didn't think I'd ever get to it, did you? I'm concluding this message series on the, this advance. And for me, advance means that I'm moving forward in the will of God for my life, for my family, for my marriage, for my church, for my career. In spite of the opposition, in spite of the persecution, in spite of the resistance, in spite of the difficult circumstances. And all through the series, we've been talking about how the Lord advances his kingdom in spite of militant opposition. He said the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing Paul said the things that have happened to me in prison in this prison cell in Rome and these chains has advanced actually advanced the God. don't we serve a great God a God that'll take bad circumstances coming against you and turn it for victory in his kingdom you meant it evil God intended it for good I want to tell you in Christ we always win don't we this morning, I want to focus on that will of God because we're advancing. We're not just advancing. We're going somewhere, and we're advancing in what God's will is and that the Lord will open a door or he may shut a door so that we can live our lives in the center of his will. How many of you are glad for some shut doors? That's me too. Glad God didn't let me go there. I'm glad that it wasn't his will for me to go there. And 
he opens those doors. And Jesus had this to say. Look at it with me. In Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, he reveals himself by saying he, he's talking to this group of believers at Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. A church was there. And Jesus himself is addressing them. He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David and opens and no one will shut and shuts and no one opens. That's a messianic introduction there that Jesus gives to them, reminding them of of Isaiah 22, 22, that he has the key of the house of David. You know, when Jesus came, he opened up the kingdom of God to everybody, whosoever will. He has the keys of death and of Hades, all power in heaven and on earth, he said, is given to me. And he opens up to us the gospel of the kingdom for us personally and for us to share this gospel of the kingdom in our world. People are hopeless. They need hope this morning, your family members. Yesterday as we were praying, I'm believing God that if there were drug addicts in there, they're going to feel the presence and power of God. If there's little children that are being abused, the power of that prayer is going to turn the heart of a mom and a daddy. I'm believing that that person that may feel like they're in the pit house, but they're lonely and they need Jesus. They're going to feel his presence. They're going to feel somebody loves them out there and there's hope. But you know, that's what Jesus is opening up in his will. Then he says, he says, I know your deeds. Wow, and he loves us anyway. Uses us anyway, right? Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you have a little power... And have kept my word and have not denied my name. The question I get asked most often is, Pastor, what's the Lord's will for my life? Or, Pastor, how can I know that I'm living in God's will? Maybe you've asked that. Am I living in God's will? Am I living where he wants me to be? I believe what the scriptures teach me if I can just share it this way, is that God's will for my life personally is not some narrow path where God predetermines every minute detail of my life. He doesn't pre-program and predetermine where I'm going to go to church, what job I'm going to get, who I'm going to marry. Now, that might mess some of you up. In other words, I don't believe that there's one person out there in the universe or on earth, we hope, that's the only person. Are y'all tracking? You know, on the other hand, when God gives me this great ability of freedom of responsibility and choice, I see it as a path, a road. And on either side of this road, there are two safety barriers to the will of God. There's the moral will of God. That means that God has already told me in his word what his will is. You know, I can ask him to bless adultery all I I would want to, but he ain't blessing it. I can ask him to bless this gossip session I might have. He ain't blessing it. I can ask God to bless my grumbles and my complaints. He's not blessing because he's already told me. I have no need to pray about it. He's already the safety barrier over here is the moral will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3. This is the will of God that you be sanctified and avoid sexual immorality. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, we looked at it last week in the message there. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
You know, I've read some pretty stern things the Lord had to say to Israel in 1 Corinthians, New Testament, chapter 10, as an example of grumbling and complaining. It's the will of God that we live thankful lives and grateful lives. It's the will of God that I live like Jesus, Romans 8, 28, 29, to be conformed. Now, you know, that's kind of bottom line in it, isn't it? So God has given me this moral will that he's already written for me in his word. If I just will read it, my life will be blessed. His name will be glorified. And everything that I'm about is going to fall into place in my life. On the other side of that open area of the will of God, it's what I call the sovereign will of God. That means that God's going to do it with or without you. That means that he's doing something in this world. And what I want to do is see what he's doing, find out what he's doing, and do it with him. In other words, he said in Matthew 16 and 18, on this rock I will build my church. It doesn't matter how many governments rise and fall. His church will be built. Amen. He said, my word is forever established in heaven. They can bury it and burn it and ban it all they want to throughout the centuries. It always rises up and still the best seller today. I'm just talking about the sovereign will of God. The sovereign will of God that Jesus is coming again. Nothing nobody can do about it. It's going to happen. So you got the two safety rails, the moral will of God and the sovereign will of God. Well, right in the center of that is my personal will from God. Where God has given me gifts and abilities and a calling on my life. And what he is saying to me is that I need to line my life up in the center of his will. Knowing that there's this safety barrier over here that he's not going to give me a pass on in the moral. If I'll keep my life in the center based on his moral will and his sovereign will and do what he is doing. Let me tell you something about the sovereign will of God. When you and I realize that we're going to do what God is blessing and not ask God to bless what we are doing, our lives are going to be blessed. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, I don't have to ask God if pray and go is his will. I read in First. Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, I urge then that request, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be given for everyone. Not just for them in authority. Pray for those that despitefully use you. In that same context, same passage, verse 4, that he wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3 and 9, it's not God's will that any... So when I get into these areas and I know that I'm doing what he's blessing, I want to tell you my church is blessed. When I invite people to church, I'm just fulfilling Matthew 28, 19. I'm doing what he is sovereignly doing in the earth already, that I'm going and making disciples of all people, all nations. Are you all tracking this morning? And I want to live, and he's calling me in my personal will, where I make these decisions about my marriage and about my church and about my career. I need to keep them between these safety barriers. And, and when I begin to do that and live in bounds with God, hallelujah, I begin to flow in the blessing of God. What did Jesus ask us to pray? Y'all remember it, Matthew 6 and 10. Your kingdom come. What? Say it with me. Pray it with me. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done in Wayne Merritt as it is in heaven. Your will be done in Vidalia Church of God as you've already willed it. In other words, I want to find out what God's doing. Go with him and make those decisions and choices based on those two safety bears. You know, it's kind of like playing golf. and I like trying to play golf. And the, the game is so much more enjoyable and rewarding if I keep it in the fairway. When I come to the tee box and I can hit that ball, on the because the fairway is where the grass is manicured and it's low 
and it's designed for me to hit the ball again. But I'll tell you what, on either side of that fairway is what's called the rough. And on that side of the fairway is tall grass, bushes, pitfalls, ditches, trees. And when I get over there, and I do often, I like the scenic route. And I get over there, <clears throat> it's, gonna, it's rough going. It's really named right. And that's the way it is in my life. When I get out of bounds with God, things are rough. Things are hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. My life gets difficult. My life gets hard. And I'll tell you, I'm, you know, I don't want to come across like I'm this, this golfer because you just need to go play with me. But I have found this. If I hit the ball out over there in the rough, instead of trying to keep going like I have done, trying to get through that rough going toward the hole, if I'll just chip back out over into the fairway, if I'll just chip back out over into the fairway, that I can get back on track and back on course. And, you know, there's been a time or two that I've actually parred, believe it or not, after I got in the rough. And I want to tell you, if you get off track with God, all you've got, you find yourself in the rough, you got out of the moral will of God, all you got to do is confess and repent. And he'll get you back on course with him. And your life will start winning again. And your life will have purpose again. And your life will find the strength of the Lord again in your life to make a difference. And Jesus said, Behold, I put before you an open door which no one can shut. Well, Jesus open stays open. And many times people say, Well, boy, I, I missed it. I missed it. I missed God's will. I'm done. I miss God's will morally. And I want to tell you, what Jesus opens, nobody's shutting. He's opened up the way for you and me for salvation. He's opened up the way for you and I to live in his will. And at any moment, we can get back on course. We can get back on track with the Lord Jesus Christ. There are things in my life I have so little power in. And that's what he says to these people here at Philadelphia. He says to them in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he says to them, you have a little strength. And, and, and I, you know, there's some things I try to shut out of my life and I know it's not good for me, or I know it's not where God wants me to live, but I have such little strength in and of myself. But guess what? He says, I'm going to shut that out for you. If you'll trust my Holy Spirit, if you'll live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, you'll find the strength. And notice what he says to them in this passage of Scripture. He says, because you have kept my word, you've stayed in bounds, and you've not denied my name. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm simply saying that's how that I advance my life in the will of God in spite of the opposition, in spite of the difficulties, to be in the center of his will. Amen? Now, I ask myself as I prepared this message, is there a person that understood this open door that can give me some help in knowing how to live in the center of God's will with these two safety barriers Safety rails on either side to keep me in, in bounds and on track. And, and I find that person in the Apostle Paul. He talked more about the open door than anybody I know. And, and he said, uh, he said, and he came back to Antioch, him and Barnabas, after they had gone on the first missionary journey. And they had saw, it's kind of like us, and we got back with Pray and Go yesterday. I mean, we just, we just really, I'm telling you, we just really uh, saw the hand of God, felt the presence of God. And Paul and Barnabas came back, and they reported to their home church at Antioch in Acts 14 and 27 how that God had opened the door of the gospel to the Gentiles. How many of you gl are glad of that this morning? You sit here because Jesus made a way. Amen. Look at this scripture in 1 Corinthians. You know, Paul is talking about this open door. And I want you to especially pay attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. And there it is. Because notice at the end part of this verse, but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door, talking about open doors, he said a great door for effective work has opened to me. Now watch this, and there are many who oppose me. Now we'll get back to that in just a moment. You know, places like 2 Corinthians 2.12, 
He says, now when I came to Troy to preach the gospel, I found that the Lord had opened a door for me. And then notice this one. He, he asked us, the church, to pray for him in Colossians 4 and 3. And pray for us too, that God may open a door. Because he understands how important it is that they walk in the will of God and in the center of of the Lord's will and, and that opening that God's got for them. And he may open a door for our message. How many of you believe that the Holy Spirit's got to go before us? Got to prepare some hearts. Got to prepare the way when we're ministers of the Lord Jesus in whatever area, our family. And you try to do it in your own, in your own power and we don't go very far. But he says, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. There again, you see this tension between doing the will of God, opening the door that the Lord has opened, and the tension, the opposition. So God opens the door for you personally to make those decisions that are right, to do his will. What open door does he have for you this morning in your life, in your family? What does he want you to do? How does he want you to do it? To, to advance his will in this world. How do I flesh this out, this open door stuff? Well, let's walk through the door. And we're going to stay with the Apostle Paul. And I promise you that I'm going to give you some, some principles about four here. It's really a process of how we walk through the open door. It's really a process of about four steps or four stages. And I hope you get this this morning. I hope it's a blessing to you. I hope it, it will give you a, a, a more effective life. It's a husband or wife, uh, as, as a parent, as, as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. And, and he is going to bring, you know, he was the apostle. He was the messenger of the Lord to these churches. He'd start them. He might pastor them just a little while. Then he would appoint a pastor and go on because he was an apostle primarily. So he brings these Ephesian elders back in Acts to meet him, to get a report from them, how things are going. But he has this to say to them. Look at it in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 22. And now watch this. He says, this is how you walk. Notice the, there are about four stages in this process. He says, and now... Compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of grace. He wants to stay in the sovereign will of God for God's call on his life and what God's doing in the world. I want to say it again. What we need to do if you want a blessed life is find out what God's doing and do it with him. Join the journey this morning. And it's the most exciting, adventurous journey you'll ever take in your life. I'm telling you, it's full of, it's full of the unknowns for sure, but it's exciting to walk with Jesus this morning in your marriage and in your church. Amen? And here's the four stages. Number one, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It begins right here. Paul had personal desires. There was times he wanted to go in a certain town or direction to preach the gospel. And you remember reading this? I think it's in Acts 16. The Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. He said, the Spirit of Christ kept me from going. The Apostle Paul learned that he needed those nudgings of the Holy Spirit. He needed those promptings. Let me tell you something. While you're at the gym, while you're sitting in class, while you're at the Walmart, the Holy Spirit will prompt you if you'll be sensitive. We need to be sensitive to the Lord. The Holy Spirit will prompt you. He will nudge you to maybe go over and introduce yourself. Or, or you know they're going through maybe a difficult time. And just say to them, not every time, but do you mind if I pray with you for that? You might, they might not even be comfortable with you praying right there. That's okay. You can take it with you. But the point is, the Holy Spirit, if we're going to walk in the center of his will and through that open door, we, we've got to be sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. If we say we live in the Spirit, let us keep in step 
with the Spirit, Galatians 5 and 25. Now notice what Paul says here. I want to remind you again in Acts 20, 22. Look at it here again on the screen. And now compelled. Everybody say compelled. Compelled. Prompted. Yeah, that's a strong word. And, and I, know, I know in some translations, I think it might be the King James, it's little s, and the indication there, he's compelled by his spirit. But all the other translations I checked, it's a big S. It's a capital S. It's the Holy Spirit. And it means to be bound. It means to be pulled over. The Holy Spirit's pulling you. Have you ever felt that, that pulling? That, that he, that, that, like we heard testified to Wednesday night in our class, how the, the, just, just, to, just to reach over and touch somebody in a right way. You know, it's kind of like me and Miss Kim. And sometimes she talks me into going to the mall. And we're just walking through the mall. She's on my arm. And all of a sudden, I'm going to wherever she's going, belts. And all of a sudden, I feel this, this urging, this uh, pulling. And it's coming through my nose. And it's Starbucks or Joe's Coffee Shop. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. That's the kind of prompting I'm talking about. And the Holy Spirit starts prompting you. Now, Miss Kim, I hope she don't mind me saying it. Miss Kim is when we're going down the concourse of the airport, and Chick fil A does it as much as she likes it, doesn't get it, but it's that Cinnabon. Right? You know what I mean? We need a little icing on our, on our life. But, but, you know, the Holy Spirit will compel us and prompt us. So let me just ask you. You say, Pastor, that's been years since I felt that. Well, just answer a few questions. You may did ask yourself, am I in the safety rail of the moral will of God? Is there sin in my life? Because the scripture says, if I regard iniquity, the Lord won't hear me. And you've blocked off the communication of the Lord. His ear is not dull that he cannot hear. And, or, or perhaps in your life you have to ask, well, if I'm not feeling that stirring in my life, if I'm not feeling that compelling in my life, if I'm not feeling that prompting in my life, maybe, maybe what you're doing is not in the will of God. Maybe it's not lining up with what he's doing. Maybe it's lining up, not lining up with what he's blessing. Or maybe you just need to be like Timothy. and You need to fan back into flame the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's been given to you. How long has it been since maybe you got stirred in your life? And so let me ask you a question. It's not on the screen. Just ask yourself, where is God stirring me this morning? Is he stirring me for my children or my grandchildren or a co-worker? Or is he stirring me to live my life obedient to him? That's step number one. If we're going to walk out this process through these doors... It always begins in your personal life with that prompting of the Holy Spirit to go where he's directing and leading. Step number two is certain uncertainty. Certain uncertainty. Notice what Paul says here in verse 22 again. Not knowing what will happen to me there. Now, that just upends some of us. I'm certain if you're advancing in God's will, that there's going to be some uncertainty in your life. I'm certain that God's not going to give you every detail of what he's going to do next. I'm certain that he's not going to give you the full video of how it's all going to turn out. He's going to give you and me one snapshot at a time. And we take one step at a time in his presence. When God called me to pastor, I had no idea. didn't matter. The Holy Spirit had already spoken. He had already prompted, and I didn't know what I was getting into. I had to depend on God. Imagine that, that we've got to trust God. You know, Abraham was that way. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 8 about Abraham that he left his father's country. He went to a place that the Lord would give him later as an inheritance. Watch this, not knowing where he was going. When, you know, when I left the church I was at at Rinkin, and uh, 
I just knew. I knew it was time. And I didn't know Vidalia was coming up. Had no clue. And and not here try to spiritualize and over spiritualize because I know it's our decision too. And uh, but I remember talking to the bishop and I was telling him. I said, my my time is over at Rinkin. It's been a wonderful life, but I just want one more challenge in my life before I go to meet Jesus. He said, Brother Wayne, what you want to do? I said, I, I know what I, I ought to do, but I said, I don't have a clue where I'm going, but I'm just telling you I'm leaving. Now, that's a dangerous place to be, to be leaving and not know where you're going. But I knew that I knew that God, do, do y'all still believe, do we still believe that he directs the steps of those that trust him and love him? And, and just like Abraham, that's you. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 4 that you and I are to walk in the footsteps of Abraham. He didn't know where he was going. And I'm certain there's going to be uncertainty in your life. And so this is the point. Don't refrain from stepping out when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something. Don't refrain because you, you, you've got some apprehension there and you've got to trust God. That's exactly where he wants you to be. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. We walk by faith and not by sight. Do we still believe that? Amen? So where do I take a step of faith? Let me ask that question again. Where do I take a step of faith? Where is that in your life next? What's God saying? What's he doing in your life? So the Holy Spirit is prompting. And there's going to be some uncertainty about that step that he's prompting you to take. But here's number three in the process of the open door. Number three is predictable resistance. I wish I didn't have to go here because I don't like resistance. I don't like hard times and difficult times. But when you and I start advancing the kingdom of God, his will in our lives for my children, for my family. Let me tell you something. All hell's going to break loose. You know, we mistakenly think that if I'm doing it right, then there's going to be smooth sailing. If, I, if I'm in the will of God, then there's not going to be any opposition. There's not going to be any problems in my life. Everything's just going to be great in my life, but not so. When there's resistance in your life, it probably means... You're in the center of God's will. And that's what Paul says. Look at it in verse 23. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Remember that that scripture I told you to keep in your bank as I read them about Paul's life. In in, in verse 8 and 9, he said, A great door for effective work has opened to me. I remember as a young pastor when this hit me. And he says, and there are many who oppose me. And and I wasn't thinking about people in my church. I I really wasn't. But it dawned on me that the will of God and being in the center of his will and advancing his will, it dawned on me that most of the time, that's when Satan is going to attack me the hardest. But guess what? The battle is the Lord. God is for us, not against us. And the victory is ours if we will trust him and keep on walking. I was sitting in a pastor's conference about a week and a half ago, and uh, this, this pastor, not Church of God, but I'd been at his church before, and, and it's just, you know, this is just remarkable how God can move. Honestly, we, when we went to his church for the first time, me and a group of pastors, it's between Macon and Griffin. It is in the middle of the woods. And it's a congregational Methodist church, and the pastor named Brother Benny Tate. And I'm trying to recall the name of the church. Or I tell you, go to look at his website. It's incredible. He started there just a young man, about 25 years old, just a small little congregation, less than 50. And today, it's this, it's this great campus. I mean, you drive for miles through woods to get there. Of about 6,000 worshipers on Sunday morning. Satellite churches all around from Macon to Griffin that they minister to. And I was listening to him just a few weeks ago teach and preach. And this was incredible. I, he told the story. He said that when he ne- they needed to build, they had this little old tiny church. 
And he said so many people were coming. Somebody said to him one morning, he said, said, Brother Tate, would you just mind standing right in the center and not move about because the people standing on the outside can't see you. They can't get into church. And people were coming and driving away. And he said to his elders, said, we got to build. We got to build. And they said, no, we, we can't build. We ain't building. We're not going to build. Cost too much money. He said, well, then just go out there and put on the marquee. Go on to hell. Our church is full. And that got their attention. Now, I've never had to say that. I do remember one time when we were in a little sanctuary at Rinkin that it broke my heart because we were full. And I saw somebody walk in the back door and turned around and walked back out. It broke my heart. And that's when we built the worship center they're in now. The point is this. He said this. Brother Tate did. He said, the, 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 I guess it's wonderful. He didn't say wonderful, but he said, the thing is, the same ones that opposed me when we had less than 50 are still in the church. Now, isn't that a blessing? He said, they're still opposing me now. The more things change, the more they stay the same. But, but the point is this. <clears throat> There's going to be predictable resistance. And, and I'm not saying that the enemy uses the people. I'm just saying we know he does. And here's the question. Where is the enemy attacking me? Is the enemy attacking me? It may mean that you're in center of God's will. So the prompting of the Holy Spirit, certain uncertainty, and then predictable resistance. And here's number four. Finally. Everybody shout finally. You're at the end of the process. Stage four. Focused perseverance. Focused perseverance. Look what Paul says in verse 24 again. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task. Watch this. The Lord has given me. What the Lord's given me is not what he's given you. What he's given you is not what he's given to someone else in the church. You've got personal callings. You've got personal gifts. We all keep them between the safety rails to keep us in the center. But God uses us. But the point is we need to stay focused on the Lord. We've got to persevere. I want to just say this about perseverance. And I almost closed this series out just on perseverance today. And I, I didn't, but I do need to say this because I felt it so much in the Holy Spirit. The greatest key to success is not aptitude, it's not ability, it's not attractiveness, it's not how much political power you've got or how much wealth you've got. The greatest key to success is perseverance. And it's even greater in the spiritual realm. Endure. Because we carry that cross for the Lord and we carry that load and that's what it means to keep moving forward. It's hupomene. It means to move forward and carry the ministry and carry the burden and carry the weight of what we're doing in advancing the kingdom of the Lord. In other words, don't give up. Stay in the center of his will. The Holy Spirit's prompting you. You know, there's a voice behind you, Isaiah says, that says, this is the way. Walk in it. How many of you believe the Holy Spirit will talk to you? And he's, he's got things he wants to say about your church. He's got things that he wants to say in your family. Persevere. Perseverance. I'm closing with this. Hebrews 12 and 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance, advance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter. Stay focused on him, focused perseverance for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. David said, 
I can run through a troop and I can leap over a wall. He said, by, the, by my God, I can advance through a troop and leap over the wall. Van McCall accused me 40 years ago of saying, I can run through a wall and leap over a troop. I said, no, I didn't, Van. He said, yes, you did. No, but here it is. I can run through a troop. I can advance with God by his spirit and by his power in my life. But I got to stay focused and I got to persevere. And I got to endure looking to Jesus. Notice this great truth for you as you stand with me. When vision increases, stay focused. When vision increases, options decrease, making it easier to walk through the open door. Let's say it together. Would you say it with me? Are you ready? When vision increases, options decrease, making it easier to walk through the door. One more time as the praise team comes. When vision increases, options decrease, making it easier to walk through the door. What are you looking at? Are you focused this morning? Where's God stirring you? What do you need? Where do you need to take that step of faith that you've been reluctant? Get out of that boat. Walk over the water to Jesus. Where's the enemy attacking you? It may mean that you're right where he needs you to be. And where should my focus be? Who should my focus be on? Well, it needs to be on Jesus. But it needs to be on what he's called you to do. That's what Paul said. That I would complete my task and finish my race. I'm going to ask you to bow with me for prayer this morning. And God's calling us. And he's doing a work in us. And hallelujah. He's doing a work in our church. He's doing a work in your life. And I want to hear from him. I want to be prompted by him. And you know, I just... No matter the opposition that comes from the enemy. He's the victor. It's good to be on the winning side, isn't it? It's good to be on the Lord's side and he's on our side. Hallelujah. Probably means that the enemy's in for a good whipping in your life. You stay focused. Stay focused on the Lord. I know it's uncertain at times. I, I know if God's calling you to step out and take a Sunday school class in the church or, or, or be a part of a greeter ministry. I, I know sometimes you, you wonder, I'm, it, can I do this? Yes, you can. Because he will enable you to do what he prompts you to do. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray. I pray that we will walk in the center of your will in advance the calling that you've got on our lives as a church individually today. I pray, Father, for a great harvest in our church, in their family. Oh, God, may we see grandchildren and children come to faith in you. In the name of Jesus, help us never to give up. Help us to move in victory today and advance in the kingdom of God. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. As the praise team sings this old chorus, I'm going to invite you to come and make a commitment with me around the altar to live in the will of God, to advance the will of God. As they lead us in this chorus, sing it as you come. And would you just gather around the altar with me and let's make a commitment to the Lord that we're going to march in the center of his will. Come as they sing it, please. Lead me, Lord. Let's sing this as a prayer today.
team, lead us again. I feel that the Lord is doing something. Lead me, Lord. Seek this to you, Lord. We open up to you today. Lead me, Lord. with me right now. I just feel the Holy Spirit. We never know when the next Billy Graham is among us in a young person and a young adult and in a middle-aged person. We never know where the next Corey Ten Boom that went through so much and made such a great impact. We never know where the next Dale Moody is. And right now in this service, the Holy Spirit he is speaking. He is prompting. If he's calling you to step out for him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the uncertainties. Wherever he's calling you, he's going to provide for you. One step at a time. Hallelujah. Father, minister right now. Just bow with me, church, right now. Can we just hear from the Lord this morning? Just one more time in own heart, personally. Lord, speak this morning. We want to say with Samuel, your servant is listening. Your young servants and your old servants and your elderly servants. Those that have been the way a long time. Those that have just started out. Lord, we want to hear from you this morning. Hallelujah. God, you're making a difference in this world. I want to do what you're blessing. I want to touch people for you. In my church and in my community and my family in my marriage Father in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus would you just lift your hands right now would you just receive the word of the Lord for you and over you right now what's the Holy Spirit prompting you what's he stirring in you Father help us to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit help us to stay sensitive stay sensitive that we hear that voice behind us wherever you're leading that we go whatever you're saying we do we bless you and we honor you God I'm praying that we'll see the greatest harvest in their families in our families in our children and grandchildren oh Father stir us today strengthen us we bless you for it and here's the other side of that as you just are bowed with me in prayer you never know you might be that shoe salesman like Kimball. Don't even know his name. Hardly just remember the last one. But he was a Sunday school teacher that invited D.O. Moody to church. And the rest is history. And a direct line that would affect Billy Graham that affected so much of the world from D.O. Moody on down. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us. Help us, Lord. Would you just pray a prayer of commitment right now, just one more time. Father, help us just to be prompted by you, to be stirred by you, to take those steps that you've called us to take in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. Help us, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for the agreement. We're not satisfied with the status quo. We're not satisfied to be complacent. We're going to pursue you. We're going to go after you. We're going to advance the kingdom. Now, would you just give him praise for what he's doing? Father, thank you. And I praise you, Lord, for our church. I praise you for what you're doing in personal lives. Sing it again, praise team. One more time, maybe two or three times through, and then we're, we're through with this part of the sermon. I will follow.
And I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight someone that deserves to be highlighted. You know, the Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. And I, I tell you, this is some of the most productive teenagers and young adults of any church of any size that I've ever seen. And uh, I could go around the room and, and talk about your children, your grandchildren. And, but uh, Reagan, we just want you to know how proud we are of what God is doing through you and for you, man. And uh, it's the first of its kind, as I understand, at Vidalia High School, where a band student got such a prestigious prestigious scholarship to go to Barry, one of the great schools, one of the great music schools in the state. And we're so proud of you. And we want to say congratulations. We know that you're going to represent the Lord well wherever you are. Thank you for representing Vidalia Church of God too. Can we just give him an appreciation again? Thank you. We appreciate so very much. And Again, you know, once you start calling names, you know, you miss somebody, and I'll just stop with that. But we do appreciate all of our young people, do we not? And uh, appreciate our students and our young adults. God bless you. Just greet somebody before you go. Appreciate you being with us today in the house of the Lord.